So today, as we sing this song, if you feel comfortable, uh, anytime when you see the word one, stick up that finger acknowledging that there is only one and Lord, one Lord, one King, and his name is Jesus, and he is worthy this morning of our praise.
this time y'all can be seated as we have this time of communion. Next Sunday, July the 30th, is going to be a special offering. I've given you a heads up. Let me tell you what that means. So we're going to make an attempt next Sunday to pay off this entire debt. It'll be a little stretch, but that's good. That's what churches get best at, is stretching. So uh, I ask you to be in prayer about that, and we can get that debt cleared. Uh, that'll be $2,250,000. Not all due next Sunday, by the way. But we don't have that much left, but uh, it'll be six years. Next Sunday will be exactly six years from when we started paying payments on the debt. Some have asked me, well, what's next? What's that mean? We're out of debt. Well, I need to communicate that. Um, first thing is, we've got several projects with the current campus that need some infrastructure work, some things that need to be done here on the current building. Uh, and then, once we kind of catch up some of that, um, we are now developing a plan for a major expansion in the children's ministry. We'll start putting aside some money to try to expand our ability to expand our children's ministry. If, you haven't, if you're not connected with that, maybe you don't know that we're running totally out of room in children's ministry. And also, we would like to have the opportunity to give more away to missions. We'd like to reach more missions. So uh, we're not through. If you think we're through, then pinch yourself. We're just getting started. So um, a lot of good things coming. A lot of good things. I heard a sermon several, several years ago. The preacher was Kyle Eidemann from southeast over in Louisville. I don't remember much about his sermon, but I remember the story he told. He told the story about a man that had, was totally blind. And this man, who had been totally blind his entire life, he had never been able to see. He was 40 years old. So they told this man about a surgery that could cure his blindness. And a 40-year-old man who had never seen in his entire life has the surgery and suddenly can see. Now, that's not the part of the story that got me. What got me in the story is this. That surgery had been available for 40 years. He didn't know. You mean this guy walked around blind for 40 years and he could have had his sight any time in that 40 years had someone told him that he could see. That got my attention. It's a tragedy. Forty years of this man's life was lived in darkness because no one told him how he could see. I want to see. Do you? This, this picture today, I want to see. I, I want my eyes to be that through which light comes in. I want to see. I don't want to be blind. So I'm going to ask you a question today, probably multiple times. Do you want to see? Now, 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 I want you to be careful before you answer, because I'm going to ask you, are you sure? Because there's a whole lot of people that think they want to see. But in reality, they're really not interested in seeing. What was the scripture that Chad had you read just a moment ago? Jesus says, I came to render judgment upon the earth. I came to show the people that think they can see that they're actually blind. What's that mean? We're about to find out. I don't want to walk around in darkness when there's light available today within my grasp. Today we began a two-week journey through John chapter 9. Today I will ask multiple times the question, do you want to see? Next Sunday, it'll be a question that almost everybody at some point in their life wants the answer to. What about suffering? What about suffering? 
for the cause of Christ. So today I'm going to do something a little unusual for me. I, I, I need to read you the entire story. So I'm asking you to buckle up, listen really carefully to this story. And after I read the story, I'm going to show you what the Holy Spirit revealed to me. John 9, verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he, Jesus, spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. This man has been blind since birth. He came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, <laughs> I don't know why I find humor in it. Yeah, yeah, it's me. It's me. It's really me. Yes, it's me. They ask, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now, they ask. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. But it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them. He put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God. He is working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how can an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? So they're asking, pause for a moment, they're going to ask him, what do you think? They're, they're divided among themselves. What do you think about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leader still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he's old enough, ask him. For the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man Jesus is is a sinner I don't know whether he's a sinner the man replied but I know this I was blind and now I can see but what did he do they asked how did he heal you look the man exclaimed I told you once didn't you listen why do you want to hear it again do you want to become his disciples too you think that went over? Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. 
We know God spoke to Moses. But we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange, the blind man, formerly blind man <laughs> replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has ever been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered him. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe him. You have seen him. Jesus said, And he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show people who think they see that they are actually blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. Jesus replied, but you remain guilty. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Do you want to see? I want to see. Today I'm going to do something very simple. And yet I find it also to be quite profound. I'm going to go through this story of Jesus and the blind man, and I want to trace six steps. I don't know why, but when I read it, that's exactly what came to me. I watched six steps forward, and I also watched six steps backwards. I watched it revealed in the Scriptures with my eyes that God revealed there were six things that took a blind man to his sight. And then I saw there were six things that took people who thought they could see into total darkness, spiritual blindness. The six steps that Jesus did with the blind man gave him sight, but there are also six steps that guarantee eternal darkness, spiritual blindness. Next Sunday, if the Lord's willing, we're going to take this same story and we're going to look at the question, why was he born blind? Why was, why was he born blind? What about suffering? So let's get started. Six steps from blindness to sight. Do you want to see? And I'm going to ask you a really serious question. Are you sure? You see, if everybody wanted to see, if everybody wanted to see, if everybody wanted to see, we wouldn't have enough chairs in here today. Listen carefully to what I'm telling you. If every one of you wanted to see, there wouldn't be a Sunday you wouldn't be here. Are you sure you want to see? Because every Sunday we come in here and you know what we do? We give sight to the blind. We open up something that reveals light of the world. Now, I'm going to ask you again. Do you want to see? Are you sure? Because I meet a whole lot of people that say they want to see, but in actuality, they've gone nowhere. They've, they just walk in darkness because they've gone nowhere when sight is available, when it's within your reach to have that which opens your eyes. Do you want to see? I don't want to see one day way out there, someday way out there. I want to see today. I want to see right now. Do you want to see today right now? Because here we go. Here's step number one. Now, I'm going to start with the six steps from blindness to sight. Did you catch it? Let's start. Where, where did it start? The encounter with Jesus. 
It always starts with an encounter with Jesus. Look at, look at John 9, 1. Verse 1, just verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. It begins with an encounter. Now, if you're a believer today, if you have eyes that see today, we have all experienced this moment when Jesus revealed himself to us. He initiated this encounter. We did not initiate the encounter. The blind man didn't find Jesus. Jesus found the blind man. So this six steps towards sight begins, number one, with an encounter with Jesus that Jesus himself, by his mercy, by his grace, initiates. Maybe you were very young when you encountered him. Maybe you, maybe you were middle-aged when you encountered him or quite old. But know this, the journey toward receiving your sight must always begin with an encounter with Jesus. Step number two, the touch and the wash. Look at verse 11, verse 11. He told them, this is the blind man speaking to the Pharisees. He told them, the man they call Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. Jesus touched him. Listen to me. Jesus touched him. Yes, there was mud on his hands, but I can tell you it was not the mud that made this man see. Jesus told the blind man to go to the pool of Siloam and wash himself. Wash yourself with water. But I'm going to tell you, it wasn't the water that made him see. Does that make the water unimportant? <laughs> Does that make the water unnecessary? No. What if he hadn't washed as Jesus told him? I don't know, but I know this. I want to see. And if somebody tells me, and I'm blind, how to see, I want to see. Step number three. You are a prophet. It begins with an encounter. Then it moves to a touch and a wash. And then this man says what? Verse 17. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion of this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. Did you see it? The blind man's journey toward sight included a proclamation of faith. Did you see it? I want you, I'm not going to jump this one so quick. Did you see it? This journey towards sight includes a proclamation with his mouth of faith. I think he must be a prophet. Now you must understand that this statement is made in the middle of a hostile crowd. This is not popular for him to say that. Everybody's not going to join in and pat him on the back and say, Welcome to the team. Nuh-uh. They're going to hate him for saying that. I believe this man's a prophet. He's proclaiming his faith. You know why? Because that man made me see. Will it matter what you confess with your mouth? Are you ashamed to proclaim your faith in a hostile crowd? He's not. Romans chapter 10 says, If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I want to see. Step number four, great boldness. Did you catch it? Look at verse 27. Look, the man exclaimed, I told you, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? I, I, I tell you, I love this part. This blind beggar that everyone walked around is now bold and he's confident and he's a little sassy. Why? Because he's not a blind beggar anymore. Because he can see. 
Yesterday, this man was the garbage of society. But now, now that he has found sight, he has great boldness. You know why? Because he has a confidence that he has encountered someone greater than himself. He has encountered someone who can do what no man can do. He can make blind people see. Do you want to see? Are you sure? Step number five. Jesus is sent by God. What? How do you think that's going to go over? Look at verse 33. If this man were not from God, the blind man said, he couldn't have done it. This blind guy, formerly blind guy, acknowledges in front of a hostile crowd, Jesus is from heaven. He's from God. God sent this man into our town. Would you go out and say that? Do you want to see? Can you see? How many people have you told that, what that blind man just said? You see, no normal man can do these things. No normal man has this touch. No normal man has these words. No normal man has this power. He must be from God. Now, I can see it. Because I saw him, I can see God. Because I saw him. This blind man is actually proclaiming, because I've seen Jesus, I've seen the Father who dispatched him. You don't have to have a Ph.D. to get this, folks. This kind of power to give sight to the blind can only come from God. Do you want to see? Let me, let me pause in before I read the last of the six steps to sight. How many years would you like to be blind? How many years would you like to walk around in darkness? You see, it begins with an encounter with this one named Jesus. He touches you. He washes you. You confess with your mouth, he's more than a man. You profess with your mouth, he's from God, from heaven. How many years would you wait to start doing that? Well, you can't do that while you're blind. But you can do that when you see. Do you want to see? Or would, No, you know, I'm happy preacher just being the way I am. But you can't see. Well, I'm I've, I've grown accustomed to not being able to see. I do just fine, preacher. You know what step number six is? Worship. You can't switch the order. Look at verse 38. Yes, Lord. The bl formerly blind man says, yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped Jesus. You know, it's hard to worship Jesus if you don't believe him. I I've noticed that over the years. It's hard to worship Jesus if you don't believe him. There was an encounter. There was a touch. There was a wash. There was a proclamation of faith. He's a prophet. There was great boldness. He's from God. And all of that leads somewhere. All of that leads somewhere. What's, where's the somewhere? Worship. Worship. It's hard to worship Jesus if you can't see. It's hard to worship Jesus if you're blinded by darkness. However, when you see him and you know that he can, that he can give blind people sight, you will worship him. So before I move to the other set, six steps going the other direction, let me just say something. If you're in this worship center, in this worship service, and you struggle with worship, if you don't seem to have the energy to make these lips move, if you don't seem to have the energy or be compelled in any way to sing a song to this man Jesus, I'm asking you, can you see? Because the reality is, when we gather, if you believe Jesus was standing up here, I believe you'd open your lips 
and you'd sing a song. And he promised us he'd come here today. When two or three are gathered, I'll be in your midst. In fact, he promised us even more than that. He'd move inside of these mobile temples and dwell among us. If you're struggling with worshiping Jesus, maybe you're not seeing too well. If you're struggling with this book called the Word of God, if you're struggling, you say you want to see, but you don't look in the one book that opens your eyes. Maybe you're not seeing so well. Now, let's turn the other direction. The Pharisees were becoming blind. They were walking into the darkness. You know what the greatest blindness is? Religious blindness. The Pharisees are becoming blind. What would it look like? It's the same story, but it also has six steps. But these steps lead to blindness, not sight. These, these six steps don't walk toward God. These six steps walk away from God. Who would choose blindness? Who would choose darkness when light is available? Why wouldn't you just turn around? Why wouldn't you just turn around? The Son of God is standing in front of them, and they cannot see Him. How? How? They're blind. So let's look at the six steps. It's in the same story. Number one, it begins with the rejection of truth. Listen carefully. The rejection of truth leads to religious blindness. Let me do it again. The rejection of truth will lead you to religious blindness. Verse 15, the Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Confronted with the truth, this man is telling the truth. I met Jesus, he put mud on my eyes, he told me to go wash my eyes, I can see. Why are you struggling with this? Confronted with the truth. They chose to reject the truth. It's not like the truth wasn't there. It's not like the truth wasn't reachable. They rejected outright the truth. And here I hold it up today. How many people outright reject this truth? Confronted with physical evidence of a life changed by the encounter with Jesus, they reject it. Blind from birth, and now he sees. How in the world do you fake that? The only way to reject this event, listen, the only way to reject this event is to become blind yourself. The only way to deny the power of God is to become blind. And if you reject the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth today. If you reject the truth, and I'm holding it up, if you reject the truth, you will go blind. I'm referring to a spiritual blindness that leads to death. Let me prove it to you. We live in the Bible Belt. We're pretty sheltered here. Churches in Anderson County right now, in Anderson County today, are denying the virgin birth of Christ. Rejecting the truth. Is it that they don't have the truth? They got the truth. They reject the truth. In Anderson County, there are churches that reject the virgin birth of Christ. In Anderson County today, there are churches marrying homosexuals to each other. And some of you may be struggling with this. And some of you might be struggling with this. You know why? Because your eyes are starting to grow dim because you have not put enough light into your hearts to know the truth. I wonder how many churches will be left standing on the last day. I wonder. I wonder. It's called religious blindness. It begins, step number one, to walk into the darkness is to reject the truth that's right in front of your eyes. Oh, you know it says that, but it doesn't mean that. Do you want to see? Step number two, into the darkness. Deny Jesus as the Son of God. 
Do you think the virgin birth's important? Do you think it's one of those things we can just agree to disagree on? Look at verse 16. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God. <laughs> you tell me what the difference is. If a church down the road denies the virgin birth of Christ, you know what they're saying? This man Jesus is not from God. Really? You think he's Joseph's boy? Let me read again, verse 16. So the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he is working on Saturday. He's working on the Sabbath. Others said, how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was deep division of opinion among them. Bear in mind that these people who say he's not from God, these people are religious folks. Now I'm going to take it a step higher. These people are the most religious folks on earth. They are struggling with the physical evidence of a man standing in front of them that was blind from birth, and now he can see. And what do they focus on? In the middle of their tough decision to accept the physical truth in front of their eyes, what do they struggle with? Saturday. If he'd have done it on Thursday, we're in. But if he does it on Saturday, I'm out. Does that sound crazy to you? If Jesus were really from God, he wouldn't have saved this man from blindness on Saturday. That was their conclusion. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. You know what? Don't laugh. I've seen crazier things than that in the church. Let me give you a couple of examples. I was in a church one time that was going through some growth and it's back in the old days when they used to have those attendance boards that they'd put on the wall and they'd tell you how many people were in Sunday school and they'd tell you how many, how many, what was the attendance in worship and how much the offering was is put up front. Some guy would go up in the middle of the service and put numbers in, which I always found incredibly distracting. Here's the preachers preaching, everybody's looking, well, how many's here today? How much money did they get? So somebody made a decision. Oh, my, what a decision. Now somebody made a decision. They were going to move that board from the front of that church and put it somewhere else. Get out the paddles. We're going to have to start some hearts. I watched. I watched with my eyes some guy flip out, flip out over moving that board from the front of that building. In fact, here's what he said. If that Boards, not back up there next Sunday. I won't be back. <laughs> Blind as a bat. Blind as a bat. That's why you come to church. That's why you come to church here. Really? These were the most religious people on earth. And they are standing in front of a man who's been supernaturally healed by the Son of God. And if he'd have done it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Sunday, they're all in. But because he did it on Saturday, they can't deal with it. Some people leave the church for various reasons today. This is just a picture of our humanity. Some people leave for various reasons. Maybe, maybe there's an instrument in the band you're not happy with. Uh, you can do that one, but not this one. One of my favorite stories, this been 20-something years ago. I go to a church. First time I was ever in the church, they invited me. I didn't invite myself. I walk up there, and I made a tragic error. I walk up to the podium. I admit it was a tragic error, okay? I'll say it up front. I walk up to the podium. I stand at the podium, and I look back just like I am right now. And I said, that is the largest clock I have ever seen on the inside of a building. And I just looked at it. It was going, tick, tick. It was, the hands were that long. And you know, every one of you all laughed, but there wasn't a single person in that church thought that's funny. <laughs> Blind as bats. 
deny Jesus and see what happens to you. You see, here's the deal. Don't try to put the Son of God inside your box. Jesus, I know you can't be from God because you did this on the Sabbath. Don't try, you, don't try to build a box and say, Jesus, you've got to stay inside the box to be my Jesus. Jesus does not have a box. He is the box. Do you want to see? Are you sure? Number three, these people are walking into darkness. They try, why don't you try to glorify God without Jesus? Why don't you try to glorify God, the Father, and leave Jesus out? Look at verse 24. For the, so for the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this, okay? Anybody with me? They call in this guy for the second time, and what is their so-called objective? God should get the glory for this blind man's sight. Because we know that Jesus is a sinner. So they think they're going to give glory to God by calling his only begotten son a sinner. Bad idea. Do you think God will be glorified by calling his son a liar, a sinner? What are they going to do with this Jesus? You see, that's the real struggle that day. The struggle that day is not the blind guy. The struggle that day is, what am I going to do with this man named Jesus? He heals on Saturday, so he must be a sinner. What are we going to do with him? What are you going to do with this Jesus? It's the biggest question you'll ever face in your life. If you try to glorify God without Jesus, you're going to go blind. I'm going to tell you. If you think some religion's going to allow you to glorify God, you're going to leave Jesus out of the equation. You're going to go blind. What do you think Islam is? Listen, what do you think Islam is? It's an effort to glorify God. They call him Allah, but they're going to leave Jesus out. What do you think Hinduism is? They believe there are many gods, but Jesus, no, you don't qualify. What about Buddhism? There are many people who have this effort that they can glorify God without acknowledging the deity of his son. You'll go blind. Because, you know, listen, listen, you understand what I say when I say go blind? You won't know that you're blind when you get this blindness. You'll think you can see, but you're blind as a bat. You think you can see. These religious dudes, they think they can see, but they can't see. Number four, den deny Christ and hate his followers. You see the steps? Every one of them are in this story. They're all today. Nothing's changed. Look at verse 28 and 29. Then they cursed him. Who are they cursing? The blind guy. The formerly blind guy. Why are they cursing him? What did he do? I woke up today and some guy came to me, put mud on my eyes, told me to wash, and I can see. Curse you. Why would they curse him? They cursed him and said, you are his disciple. Well, that's why they cursed him. But we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Do the Pharisees like this guy, this formerly blind guy? No. Why don't they like him? Are they rejoicing? Is anybody, anybody, stop for a moment. Is anybody surprised that no one seems happy that this dude's been blind his whole life can see? They're cursing the guy who has just received the greatest blessing of his life. Why are they cursing him? Because of Jesus. Why else would they be mad at this guy who has received his sight? When you deny Jesus, listen carefully, when you deny Jesus and all that he is, you will be forced, you will be forced, you will be forced to hate his followers. I'm going to say it again. When you deny Jesus and all that he is, you will be forced to hate his followers. Look at the world we live in today. The hostility toward Christians is on the increase. Why? 
Jesus said, they hated you because they hated me first. And if you hate those who have received their sight because they have encountered Jesus, you'll go blind. I've noticed that if I speak against sin, boy, I tell you what, anymore, I get it. Boy, you, you got to, church, y'all better learn how to toughen up. You better learn how to toughen up. You go out of here and you talk about the truth of Jesus Christ and somebody barks at you twice and you come home, they busted me. You need to toughen up, church. Jesus told us in advance, they're going to hate you because you follow me. Just come to grips with it. If I speak against sin, I, I'm expecting the world to hate me. If I hold to an absolute truth, which I believe I hold in my hand, I expect the world to hate me. If I talk about sexual sin, which seems to be the sin that the church is struggling the most with today, blows me away. It blows me away that people in the church don't have a problem with adultery. They don't have a problem with living together outside of marriage. They don't have a problem with homosexuality. It's sexual sin. Well, you know what? Everybody's got their own thing. Blind as bats. And I say that, and I know. You think I don't realize that some people, probably even in this room right now, are going to say, yeah, you're one of those haters. No, I love you enough to tell you how to get your sight. I love you enough to tell you where you can go so that you'll, see, you'll be able to see. Step five. Self-righteousness. Self-righteous fools. I'm going to say it again. These were the most religious people on planet Earth. And Jesus is standing in front of them and they don't know who he is. Verse 34. The religious guys are looking at the formerly blind guy. Here's what they say. You were born a total sinner. Are you trying to teach us? You see the arrogance? You see the spiritual arrogance? You're trying to teach us? You were born a total sinner. That's why you're blind. Jesus already said that's not why he was born. And they threw him out of the synagogue. Religious blindness. They're, they're throwing him out of the synagogue. It's blind as bats. So blind that they can't look in the mirror at themselves. So blind that they think they're the only ones that can see. Did you notice that nowhere in this scene is anyone excited that a man blind from birth can see? Only Jesus seems to care about that. Arrogant, blind fools. Do you, know what arrogant, do you know what arrogant, blind fools do? They throw out of the synagogue the only man in there that can see. You find that strange? They throw out of the synagogue the only one that can see. If you become a self-righteous fool, you'll go blind. Do you want to see? And here's the final step. I call it 2020 blindness. Perfect blindness. Absolute blindness. Look at verse 39. Jesus told them, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are actually blind. How's your vision? Do you have 20-20 vision or 20-20 blindness? Don't go ask somebody that's blind to check your eyesight. Listen up, church. Don't go ask somebody blind to check your eyesight. You know what happened that day in the Pharisee synagogue? They all looked at each other and said, yep, you're seeing good. Yep, you're seeing good. They're all blind, and they're all telling each other that they all see just fine. But they're all blind. Don't ask somebody who's blind to check your eyes. Almost all the Pharisees had gone blind and they threw out everyone that Jesus gave sight to. That decision, remaining in their own self-righteous darkness, made them go blind. Jesus is the only eye doctor. If you'll encounter him, you can see. 
And if you're seeing an eye doctor other than Jesus, can I just tell you the diagnosis? You will go blind. Do you want to see? I noticed these six steps to light, to sight, and I also noticed these six steps to darkness. I am not trying today to focus on the six steps, but the value of seeing. To see what? I want to see Jesus. Notice the sequence of events with this blind man. Let me summarize and I'll close. He encountered Jesus. He experienced his touch and was washed and made clean. He announced with his mouth that Jesus is a prophet. He was bold and gave testimony even when those around him became angry and hateful. He proclaimed loud and often that Jesus is from God. He is the Son of God. And then what? What about after you have received this sight from Jesus? Then spend the rest of your years worshiping him. The one that can make blind people see. The one that turns blind beggars into bold believers. But there's another option. There's another option. If you take this other option, you will go blind. These six steps are actually away from God rather than toward God. Why? Because these six steps acknowledge that you have actually, unknowingly perhaps, turned your back on God. You'll go blind. Reject the truth that is right in front of you. You know, you can reject this in multiple ways. You can read it and reject it, or you can just not read it, and it's the same rejection. You refuse to live under it. You can even know what it says and refuse to do it, and you're still rejecting it. Reject the truth, you'll go blind. Deny Jesus as the Son of God, and you'll go blind. Try to glorify God without glorifying and accepting His Son, you'll go blind. Become a self-righteous fool that looks down your nose at everyone that truly walks with Christ. Yeah, you're one of those Jesus radicals. The church has always been Jesus radicals. Surround yourself with blind people always talking about how good your vision is, and you'll go blind, and then you'll be blind forever. What is blindness anyway? It's darkness. To receive your sight is to receive the light. The story of man begins with darkness, and for many it will end in darkness. In Genesis 1, here's what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said something, let there be light. And there was light. Now listen, what's amazing about this to me has always been that this was specifically described as day one, but he didn't make the sun and the moon and the stars until day four. So what is this light that appears over the surface of the darkness? It is him. He is light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated, listen, 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 he separates light and darkness. What is sight? It is light. He separated light from darkness. He's going to do that again, by the way. God called the light day and the darkness night, and everything passed, and excuse me, evening and morning came, marking the first day. Some of you in the room today have experienced the roots study that we did a few years ago called from Zechariah. You know how powerful that book is. And Zechariah describes the return of Christ to the earth. And notice what happens when he comes. Before I read it, I'm going to ask you, do you want to see? Because I've read the book that gave me eyes to see what's coming. I can tell you what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Zechariah 14, 6. On that day, the sources of light will no longer shine. Yet there will be continuous day. Only the Lord knows how this could happen. There will be no normal day and night, for at evening time it will still be light. It began with God separating the light and the darkness, and it's going to end with eternal light, which means all the darkness will have to leave. 
In the New Testament, Jude announces the future of all who choose to be blind. Do you want to see? Jude one thirteen. They are like wild waves of sea, wild waves of the sea churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. Do you want to see? Then today use your ears to listen to the word of God. Verse 5, last verse. But while I am here in the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you reject this light, you will go blind. Nobody would be blind on purpose. Those Pharisees didn't choose to be blind on purpose. There is a liar, a deceiver who is destined for darkness. Don't listen to the liar. Don't follow him. Follow Jesus. Would you like to see today, or maybe you'd prefer to be blind just a little while longer? You know, it looks like blind people have more fun. I heard somebody tell me that one time. You remember that Kyle Eidemann story I started with today? Forty years, forty years, forty years, this guy walked in darkness when any day inside that forty years he could have had sight. That's the tragedy. There are more than likely people in this room today who could today receive eyes that see. Would you walk out that door today saying, no, I've grown accustomed to being blind. How many years will you waste walking in the dark when you could have the light of Christ? I'm going to ask Chad to come out for the invitation. I was at camp this past week, more out of touch, way more out of touch than normal with what's going on in the world. But I did notice something. I really didn't have it in the notes until I read Zechariah 14, 6. But on Monday of this past week, 7, 17, 17, Tim and I talked about this yesterday. On Monday, some of you may have heard the news in Israel, they're, they're fighting over the Temple Mount. In 1967, when Israel took East Jerusalem, they took control of the Temple. But immediately, they gave the management, the daily control over to Jordan and some organization. So, for 50 years, since 1967, 50 years ago, the Jews have not been able to pray and worship openly on the Temple Mount. It's under Jordanian control, Muslim control. Monday of this last week, the first time in 50 years, the priest prayed on the Temple Mount. Some of you say, so what, preacher? Well, if you say, so what, preacher, it's because you haven't been reading this book. Because it's in there. Because it's in there. I'm not going to act like I understand all this. I don't. I know this. Jesus is coming. Heaven's coming. He says that those, he'll come like a thief in the night. You know what? That's for the blind folks. And then he says, but he won't be like a thief to you because you are children of the day. You see, and you'll know. You won't know the day and you won't know the hour, but you'll know. Do you know? Can you see? Do you want eyes that see? Ears that hear, a heart that believes, receives, and obeys? You've got to encounter this Jesus. The invitation's open. Let's stand. And open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And open the eyes of my heart, because I want to see you. Because I want to see you. Let's sing that again. And open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And open the eyes of my heart. Yes, I want 
It's Miss Rachel. And, uh, she came home from camp this week, and while she was at camp, she decided, as Terry's been talking about, that she wants to see. And uh, I couldn't be more proud to be her father. And uh, years ago, when we came home from Ethiopia, she was uh, <laughs> a little scared of me. She didn't. She didn't want much to do with me. Didn't want to let me hold her. But one day. Uh, that fear of me was overcome uh, because of her fear of our cat and she decided that uh, <laughs> I could hold her and protect her from the cat and uh, from then on uh, I try to hold her every chance I get and today I get to take her in my arms again and uh, she's there not out of fear but out of love for God and for her Savior and coming in surrender and dependence on him and um, I get to be just a small part of taking her in my arms one more time and, and just handing her to the one that can offer her Amen. what no one else can. So, Rachel, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, your Savior and Lord? Yes. I ask you to repeat that after me. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God, the Son of the living God, my Savior and Lord. My Savior and Lord. All right, baby. Take my hand. I'm thrilled to baptize you in the name of Father God, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death.
burial, the resurrection. Amen. Jonathan and Angela and all of his children, Angela wanted me to make clear that also they're today they would like to make Nineveh their church home. And God continues to assemble the body of Christ at Nineveh. So I ask you, ask you to welcome them, rejoice with their family. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We were all blind one day, and you met us on a road. We encountered you. You touched us, and you washed us. You gave us a confidence and a boldness that we're not ashamed to proclaim you are even more than a prophet. And now we worship you. The one who gives sight to the blind, sets captives free, prepares a place in eternity next to you. So receive our worship today. Father, make us strong and very courageous in these last days. Put a fire inside of us like you did Jeremiah so that we cannot hold it in. And send your church out of here with this good news. There is a man who gives sight to blind people. In Jesus' name, and amen. Thank you for being here.